All right, it looks like we are live. So welcome everyone to our MBC webinar series with survivingbreastcancer.org. You might have noticed that we took a little bit of a break um, for the summer, but we are back and we have a stellar lineup, if um, I say so myself, because I scheduled it, um, for the next couple of months. Uh, but we wanted to start out, um, because our commitment to all of you in starting this series is to talk about the things that other people are not necessarily talking about. Talk about those things that are significant for us in the MBC community, but maybe aren't talked about in, um, in kind of the normal breast cancer circles. And one of those things is uh, parenting. Uh, many of us are parenting or grandparenting or step-grandparenting or bonus parenting, all of those ways that adults can be involved in children's lives. And because we're living with something that is often visibly serious, um, because we're living with something that means we might go to the doctor all the time or we might go to the hospital, these things are very visible to the children around us. And then how do we deal with that? How do we talk to the children in our lives? How do we manage to keep parenting the best we can while we're also dealing with so many difficult things? So. I'm super excited that Carrie Denny has joined us today, and we're going to be talking through some of these weighty issues. We did have a couple of other people who were hoping to be with us, but as what happens with NBC, we've got people in treatment, we've got people who just aren't in a good headspace to be able to talk about these things tonight. So um, we're going to have a great time with who is here, and I firmly believe that in these situations, who is meant to be here is here. So Carrie, you were clearly meant to be here tonight. Um, so Laura, did you want to talk a little bit about SBC or anything beforehand, or we want to do that at the end? I feel like there's like a drum roll. I'm just so excited. As you mentioned, we were away kind of like rejuvenating and working on other projects and all the things in our back pockets, um, this summer. And so I'm just overly enthused to be back and supporting, um, these conversations, these dialogues and seeing all of you guys. So thank you. Wonderful. Well, and thank you, Laura, for, as always, supporting the things that are important to the NBC community. I always appreciate organizations that are willing to understand that the NBC experience is just different from the early stage experience. So always appreciate you, Laura, for, for that. Um, so let's just dive right in. So Carrie, would you like to introduce yourself to, to our audience? Hello, everyone. My name is Carrie Danny. I am a mother of two. I have two daughters. Um, we just celebrated their birthday this past weekend, and that's always super exciting. I go get a little carried away, quite honestly, but I want to celebrate and I want it to be memorable. And um, so they just turned seven and nine. And um, both of my daughters are autistic and um, the youngest was nonverbal until age four. Um, and so she, in addition to my illness, she's needed speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, developmental therapy, a lot. Uh, she was kicked out of two preschools <laughs> for behavior. <laughs> um, but <laughs> but um, that, that is what keeps me going you know, more than anything, because I, they, they need me and it has to be me. Um, it has to be me, but, um, I try to remind myself it gets to be me. You know, I get to be there, uh, through all the tears, all the messes, all the sass, all the attitude that we gave our moms. <laughs> um, but I, it, it has changed my perspective on like those difficult times in parenting and, and those hard moments too. Like I am just really grateful for everything for every day and, and to be there with them. And that, yeah, that's been my biggest motivation to keep myself going. Um, I, I was diagnosed with early stage breast cancer in May of 2017, and then it was stage four by the end of the year. So um, that happened very quickly, and uh, my children were young, and I've been stage four most of their lives. And um, so it's just, it's just our lives now where we, you know, 
we just have to go with it. <laughs> um, a little bit more just about me. Um, I also have a pet bearded dragon. Really love her. Um, we also probably should claim all of the stray cats in the neighborhood because we feed them and buy them houses in the winter. <laughs> um, and we just put down our dog that we had for 15 years. We just put her down last week. That's, oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, my that's goodness. so difficult. But again, I'm just grateful. That's a long time with one pup. And um, we're very, very grateful. So yeah, just focusing on, you know, celebrating each day and being present and, and being grateful for the things that I do have. I love how you've reframed the, you know, these are difficult things that I'm dealing with with my children, but you reframe it to be, but I get to do these things with my children. I, I, that's just such a great way of changing the perspective on on these things that, that can be very, very difficult. So um, most of you all know me. Um, I moderate and host the, these webinars, um, and sometimes I talk about my children. I have two boys. Uh, they were one in three when I was diagnosed in 2017 with stage four de novo uh, metastatic breast cancer, and they don't really remember what it was like prior to my, my diagnosis. My older son, a little bit, he turned four kind of in the middle of the debacle that was my initial diagnosis, but um, one of my children is ADHD. And so we've also had to navigate some of those medical things. And I don't know about you, Carrie, but I find that being a patient is almost easier sometimes than being the parent sitting there trying to advocate for your child, especially when they aren't always able to explain what's going on. And when you have a nonverbal child, like you talked about, Carrie, that can be even more complicated when they, when they can't, um, e even more so like developmentally they're young, but also they don't have the ability to, to talk about what's going on with them. Um, so obviously we're, we're going to be talking a bit more about young children, but we'll throw in some resources, um, because I know that some people who might be watching might have older children or might have grandchildren. And I think it, it tends to be a little different at, at the different developmental stages, how we talk to kids we explain to kids and, and what we tell them. Um, but along those lines, Carrie, would you like to share um, what happened and how did you handle telling your kids about your diagnosis? <clears throat> yeah. Um, similarly to you, they were so young. They were um, age two and uh, the baby was eight, eight months, I think, under a year, you know. And so I, there wasn't even really a telling them right at first because, you know, like you said, they, they didn't understand. Um, so for me, it's been more of a lot of ongoing conversations as they grow up because like you said, they, yeah, they are changing all the time. Um, so I kind of try to take their lead on it. And when they ask questions, then I answer and I'm honest and I'm, you know, um, I try to be positive, but I'm honest with them, but I don't um, necessarily bring it up a lot or, or push it on them. Like I said, I, I, you know, they'll ask questions and they'll start putting it together when, when they are ready to understand, I, you know, so, um, but yeah, it's, it's just little by little, I think of these, you know, ongoing conversations because in the beginning, um, the, yeah, they just, they didn't even think about it or understand it all. And um, they definitely started to notice more and more as they got older, even where, um, you know, my little one, my, um, when it was time to take my medicine at night, she would say, oh, no, I don't want you to take your medicine. Then you're going to go to sleep and you're not going to play with me. And they were already, you know, associating. Um, but again, I tried to just involve them in those things. So um, my little one's really good about when I have an alarm on my phone that goes off because I cannot remember to take my medicine every 12 hours. Um, and I lose my phone <laughs> all the time too. And so uh, she'll come to me with, you know, mom, holding my, mom, mom, time to take your medicine. And um, I homeschool them. So we try to just use everything for learning opportunities. So um, sometimes she'll help me 
count all my medicine when I, you know, you have the big tray with all the days and the, um, and so we'll count them. Okay. I need three of these and two of these. <laughs> we just, cause like I said, it is normal for us. Um, you know, it has to be. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, so they, they, I've tried to just involve them, you know, yeah, more and more, um, as they get older. So, um, yeah, helping out with my medicine is a good one. Or, um, I did, um, I know we got, uh, and, and they gave us two. So each of my girls got a brave Barbie, um, which is a bald Barbie doll for, it's a real, it's real Barbie too, you know, Barbie brand, but, um, she's bald. She's beautiful. Um, she comes with wigs, like a, like a fun one and like a professional more <laughs> one, but, um, they came, we've had got those a couple years ago now, but I remember it was a really beautiful conversation with my girls because they'd never seen a, a doll like that. Um, and so, and they liked her and they, you know, but they were a little confused or they had questions. And we talked about how even without hair, they were really beautiful. They were women, they were moms, they were, you know, and, um, and it was just, like I said, it was, I remember that, um, when they were maybe, I want to say they were like around five, six, set those, you know, they were a little bit younger, but, um, that was such a great way for them to see it and understand it and it not be a scary thing, um, that I've, not had hair at sometimes, sometimes I do. And, so, and, um, but yeah, it just made it more fun. And, um, I get like, so easy, I think easier for them to understand and even easier for it, like opened up for them to ask questions about it. And, um, and it was, it was, it was just great. So that, um, and it's just like an online form and those are free. And that was, they loved those dolls. We still have them. That's awesome. That's awesome. So Laura will share the the link uh, that you shared with us, Carrie, and thank you for for sharing that because um, those visible signs of somebody being sick can often be the things that kids will focus on. I, I remember quite vividly when my mom went through uh, breast cancer treatment now about twenty years ago. Uh, one of my siblings, uh, uh, my one of my sisters, uh, was in middle school and she did not want my mom to walk around bald. She really wanted my mom to wear a wig, especially out in public. And she was old enough to, to express those things. Um, when I was bald the first time, uh, my dad and my husband both shaved their heads. And so everybody was bald. And so it wasn't as daunting, I think, because my kids were able to see other people um, were having, obviously it was for different reasons that they shaved their heads, but, um, you know, they were able to see more than one person who didn't have hair. But while I don't have older children thinking about my sister's reaction, I suspect that different kids are going to have different reactions at different ages to those visible signs of, of illness and, and maybe want to handle that in, in different ways. I only wore a wig one time because it was too hot. And I didn't want to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. um, Can't do my, it. Won't do it. It's just a time. It's, it, it was okay. It's exactly. hot. Exactly. Can't do it. And it grows back. And, you know, I think that um, it, it's also, I'm sure you think about this too, Carrie, thinking about um, showing, demonstrating to our kids the whole idea that everyone is beautiful, right? That there are different sizes and different shapes of people and, and all of those things. But you know, not maybe passing on some of those hangups that we might have about our bodies. Do you talk with that about that with your kids? Yeah, yes, um, we do. And I think, you know, you're right, because it's, um, we want our kids to be confident and love themselves. But a lot of us have a really critical uh, inner voice, you know, really, um, I had really negative self-talk for, for quite a while. And that was something I had to really work on because I didn't want my daughters doing that, you know? And, um, so I've, I've been, um, a lot less judgmental and critical of myself, um, which is really cool because it's made me less judgmental of everyone else <laughs> because I'm just like, no, we're all doing our best. We're, we're all, you know, trying to get through. Um, 
But yeah, we, we do talk a lot about, like you said, just how people are different and look different. And I think it opened up uh, cool conversations also about how girls can have short hair, men can have long hair. Um, they had a friend um, who he he just recently cut it, but he's nine, the same as my oldest. And he always had long, beautiful, flowing hair his whole, you know, since he was little. And, uh, and there's other, you know, people we would know. But yeah, it just gave us all so much more freedom to be like, okay, you don't have to have your hair any certain way because because of any, you know, just like I said, for the, for the friends who are boys for, for, you know, and, and they'll talk about it. And so we would talk, I was, cause they'll, sometimes they'll say, you know, again, just ask questions. And I would say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm a girl and I have really short hair and, and they, and they, my girls do always tell me that I'm beautiful, which is so sweet. Um, so yeah, it's been, like I said, it's been really great. I think, um, kind of giving them just really open minds and to think, yeah, People can look all kinds of different ways. I have blue hair just because I can, and it's fun, and I've never had blue hair before. <laughs> That's great. That's great. So when there have been other adults in your children's lives, I know you said you're homeschooling, so maybe they're not um, around teachers or other adults, but how, how do you handle telling those other adults about what's going on in your life so that they are aware of what your kids might be dealing with? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's true. They're not, um, they're homeschooled. So they are with me a lot. Um, but we are really fortunate to have, um, some hours for in-home support services and respite care. Um, so we do have a close friend. Um, that's been difficult, of course, to find someone reliable and someone who can handle the girls. And we've, this is not our first, <laughs> Not our first care provider, you know, but it's um, it seems to be going well. Um, but I I have um, you know I have shared a lot with I I just yeah I'm just I'm very open about you know what what I need help with and that's been hard. Like when I first got sick, I had not only did I not want to ask for help because I'm the mom and I'm the fixer and I'm the doer and I but I didn't even know how to ask for help. It was, it was so hard. Um, I had to learn and I, cause I, you know, and people will say, Oh, let us know what you need, anything you need. But you're like, I was so overwhelmed. I didn't even know what I needed and yeah. nobody was stepping up. So I had to think of really specific things like, no, I need help washing the dishes because my chemo is flaring my hand foot syndrome and my hands are peeling and burning. And, um, but just, and reach out and, and ask. And, and um, so I've had friends come and stay with us. Sometimes we now have um, just as more recently, the, the in-home care provider, and that's been really helpful. And, um, but yeah, just being really honest about, like I said, like, I want to just, I want to do it all. I want to keep my house clean and, um, you know, spend time with my kids and look fabulous. And, but I, it's not, <laughs> I gotta, you gotta just choose one maybe and go with it. <laughs> at least one per day, right? One right, day. Yeah, yeah. So just that too, like letting go of like I have to be this perfect mom. I have to um, do all the things, you know. No, I I need help, and I've um, I've had to kind of I guess I don't know humble myself or just just admit that I need help. But there's been friends and family that have stepped up to you know make a freezer meal or. Um, come help me clean up after the birthday party or, you know, just because I don't have the energy and um, I really want to um, still do those big things. You know, I want to have a big party and I want to have, um, yeah. So I think just being honest about what, what I need and my kids too, with their behavior issues or their speech issues or their, you know, challenges. Yeah. Just being really honest. Um, there's a lot of good books that I have found on on that as well, like on autism specifically for my kids or on um, uh, declarative language, like how to talk to not um, raise stress. Um, so, and even for my friends, my for my children's friends, um, I've given their parents books and like highlighted 
<laughs> sections where it's like, this is, you know, what would help, this is what to avoid doing or, you know, and, and their little friends have been amazing. I mean, they're kids, you know, um, the 10 year old that I'm thinking of is the best one at their party just a couple days ago. She was awesome with my little one when she got overwhelmed, when it was too loud, she took her to the back, she helped her, she kept her calm. Um, and they've been really understanding, but we've had to educate people. People do not know anything about cancer. Yeah. Absolutely nothing about metastatic or what that means or like your, what that means for the future of your treatment or they're so confused. And um, and same with, with autism, neurodivergence, ADHD. Um, so I have, I guess, taken it upon myself to educate. <laughs> but I think when, yeah, when people understand more what's going on, they've been really supportive. They have, but they don't come to you with that knowledge and right. understanding. So like I said, finding books or, you know, short YouTube videos or however people best digest things and just sharing information and, and saying this, you know, this is what works. And, um, a big part of that for me has been just doing what is right for me and my family, even if that is different than what my parents did, what grandma thinks, what, you know, perfect mom's club thinks. <laughs> Where's that? Who, who I don't know. That? I'm not in it. <laughs> me neither. <laughs> right. But, you know, there's just so much judgment, pressure. Yes. advice, unsolicited advice. And oh, yeah. um, so learning to ignore that and, and focus on doing, you know, what is right for me with my health, with my energy, with, and, and what my kids really need. And yeah, and even like I said, if that's really different than um, maybe what I was, you know, told what I grew up with, just, yeah. And that's, that has made us so much happier. <laughs> just uh, doing our own, you know, doing our own thing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I know. So my kids are in public school. And so um, every year what I've done is I have a letter that I add to every year, um, basically introducing my child to that particular teacher and then giving a little bit of background on what's going on with my diagnosis. You know, the idea being I would like the adults in my children's life to have a bit of an idea about what might be going on so that they can best support my children. And so in my letter, I'll say things like, you know, I often am hospitalized or, you know, I have lots of doctor's appointments. I'll have scans. I'll have, you know, different medications, that sort of thing. And I will tell you when there is a challenge like that. So that then if my child is acting up or if my child is more emotional or if my child is doing something different when they're at school, that their teachers are aware of this situation and can be um, can adjust to to those challenges or adjust to those things that my children might be encountering. We do that a little bit less with coaches um, and other people that they're involved with, just because, again, not always necessary. Um, but, you know. Things like when I was hospitalized last year with sepsis and, you know, we had to tell the teachers, hey, you know, I'm in the hospital. My kids are aware I'm in the hospital. And so that gave them a bit of an understanding, you know, just to be more flexible with, with them. Um, at the elementary age, the um, there's not always language. And, you know, we work hard to give them the language to say I'm upset, to say I'm worried to say I'm anxious, you know, to name some of those feelings, but they're not probably going to go to the teacher and say, you know, I'm upset today. So, you know, fill in the blank. And so I find that educating the people who are going to be around my children has been significant um, so that they're flexible, so that they understand. I know that not everybody is comfortable with sharing personal medical information with, with other people. Um, I have just found that to be the most productive way of making sure that my kids get the flexibility that they need when they are starting to struggle. Um, thank God there hasn't been anything too, too bad. But like I said, last year was that was pretty significant because I was in the hospital for a little over a week. And that was a long time to, to be away from them. Um, yeah, yeah. So so but, it, you know, it's always I find these conversations with other parents 
can be really interesting, right? Because um, having um, a, a diagnosis like this and you are trying to decide how much to share, um, I find I'm always like, uh, <laughs> for a second when I meet some of these new parents or when I meet some of these other adults that are involved in my children's lives. How do you handle that, Carrie? Yeah, I would have to agree. I think um, just the more information, the better, you know, but then to your point, like not too much information <laughs> because because it sounds it sounds scary. Like nobody yeah. even wants to hear the word cancer. Yeah. And, you know, like even I try to avoid saying it sometimes. And I'm like, it's not, you know, going to surprise me at this point. But I so you know what I mean? Like it's, yeah, we don't want to worry. We don't want to stress them out, but I agree. Um, it's been, even with our, with our homeschooling, you know, but my kids do swimming every summer yeah. and yeah, I have been honest with, with their coach because I can't even get in the water to swim because again, my hand foot syndrome is so bad and the chlorine and I can't even do it. And I'm like, you must be on Zalota also then. I am. <laughs> I was going to say, that sounds familiar. I am. How did you know? Oh, gosh. Yeah. And so I'm like, so you know, I can picture, you can picture me at the pool. They're doing their swim classes. And I'm like literally crying because, because I'm just, I'm so happy that they found a thing that they love and they're doing it and they're trying so hard and they're like focused. And I can't, I can't do it. I can't get in the pool with them every day. I can't stay in there. You know, I can literally like jump in and jump out and then sit on the side and th throw things to them or try to come up with games or watch right, them. Or, right. I, you know, I can't do that. And so um, I, I did share with the swim teacher because I think I was like <laughs> clearly very emotional. <laughs> but I wanted them to know that it meant a lot to us too. And that they've had the same swim teacher for two years now. And they love the girls and, um, you know, and then same, um, my oldest started horseback riding and she's really loving that. And, you know, yeah. And I have shared with them because, um, just makes everything a little easier too, because again, I have to avoid the sun and we're doing all these outdoor things and I'm not trying to, um, be, I don't, you know, I, it's confusing, I think, for people because like, there was a day I was so exhausted at swim class from the heat. It gets like 110 where I live during summer. So I, and I had to go lay down in the bleachers <laughs> because I really felt like I was going to faint, which sure. happens. And so I lay down and then the girls thought I was asleep and it was like this whole, you know, it turned into a whole kind of debacle because <laughs> Then the girls were like shouting at me and I was like, I'm not asleep. I'm not asleep. <laughs> but I wouldn't normally just go sleep during their <laughs> practice. You know, I want to watch them. I want to be there. Um, so it, it's been helpful, I think, for people to understand what's going on. Or I, yeah. I bring my chair that has, um, it's like a folding chair, but it has a, a shade canopy for, nice. for shade which yeah. is so awesome. Um, and I've just quickly kind of explained and even in the beginning, I'll just maybe even say, you know, on my medication that I'm on, I can't be on, I can't be in a lot of sunlight, you know, and kind of keep it simple. But then if it's someone we're working with more and more, I'll yeah. usually just kind of keep, keep telling them, but yeah, it's made it a lot easier for me. Um, instead of, I don't know, you know, letting them come up with their own reasons why I'm yeah. Sleeping. Right, just being upfront about that. Yeah. But as a corollary, right, then how then, um, so I'll just give an, an example. Last year, my son, who is, he's in fifth grade this year, so he was in fourth grade last year, was on a play date. And somehow the subject of cancer came up and he's like, oh yeah, my mom has cancer. And I was not present for this conversation. I got the information from the other parent who was like, oh my gosh, how do I handle this situation? And then my son proceeded to talk about how, and you know what, they don't fund research for metastatic breast cancer and they should and blah, blah, blah. So clearly he'd been listening, but it was fascinating to me. I know, right? Like raising I'm a little- Like hashtag more for, more for stage four. <laughs> okay, he's on. Um, but the only people that his friends had been exposed to who had cancer were people who were elderly and people who had passed. Mm -hmm. okay. And so- that that mom was very worried, like, how do I navigate this? Because 
to many children, you know, rightly or wrongly, they're often sheltered. They're not given the whole story. Um, they may not know, you know, and so to them, at least this group of, of boys, um, cancer equaled death. And so they got all worried. And so how do you handle that when there are other children who might be exposed to, to this concept of, of cancer and someone living with cancer? Yeah. Oh, great question. Oh gosh. Yeah. It, it's tough. I think, I mean, that made me think of so many things. Um, my mom is a two-time cancer survivor. And when I was 11, she got cancer, breast cancer the first time. And she, same thing as an adult. I mean, this was quite a long time ago. I'm in my forties, but she, um, she, same thing. She thought that this is it. This is the end because her grandmother had passed away from cancer. And she just thought, Oh no, this is the end. And she prepared me at 11, like to, to lose her. She was a single mom. And, um, just so she was like, really, you know, really, truly preparing me. And, um, but then she, she beat it and uh, she got cancer again and had to have much more treatment and, and then she beat it again. And um, so I think for me, you know, for myself, even when I did go stage four, even when, you know, I'm like, okay, I, it doesn't have to, you know, because I'm like, I had such a different experience growing up watching my mom beat it and then beat it again. And, you know, I, I was her caregiver as a child, really, because there was there was nobody else there. But um, so for me, even as a kid, I talked about cancer. I went to seminars with her to learn about the different, uh, you know, reconstructive surgery options. I went to radiation. I went to support groups. I, I went <laughs> and you were um, immersed, immersed as a child. I was. And sometimes I think like why does my whole life have to be about cancer? Like I'm sick of it already, but it just, no, no getting away with it, you know? So no, no getting away from it. And, yeah. um, and so just total radical acceptance, like this is my life. I have cancer, but I really want to live my life even, even as it is, you know? Um, but so for me, I think I know like kids can talk about cancer. Kids can have those conversations. You know, I, I did it and, and, um, yeah, so same, same as adults, but obviously, you know, phrased differently and things. And, but I just, I do try to have that very open policy, open, honest communication. Um, so because some of their friends are a little older than them as well, or, you know, friends and cousins, um, older than my kids, but still children, but they have a better understanding of, of what I'm going through, you know, and what chemo is and what, you know, just all these things. So they'll, they'll sometimes ask questions too. And I do, I try to just answer it honestly. Um, I try to be positive, you know, like I said, and tell them how my medication is working, how, um, you know, cause I, um, there was a whole over, over a year that I was in a wheelchair pretty much every day because my nerve damage was so bad. My hand and foot was so bad. Um, and my muscle tone so low, just, just everything. Um, and so that, you know, yeah, their friends had questions like, Hey, what's going on? <laughs> They've known me since they were babies. And so, yeah, they did have a lot of questions and I encourage that quite honestly, you know, I'm like, yeah, well, let's talk about it. It's, you know, and, and they can, they have pushed me in the wheelchair. They, have you know, we just, yeah, I try to, um, try to answer them, them participate in, in and yeah, and not be well. right. Not be scared of it or think, Oh, that's, that's weird. Or that's for some type of other people. Like, no, anybody could get cancer. Yeah. Anybody could be disabled. Anybody could, who knows what the, what the future holds. So, um, but their, their friends have been really supportive to the other, the other kids, or like I said, my, my nieces, nephews, my friends, kids, um, my best friend's daughter, she's a year older than my oldest best friends with both my girls. You know, they're just, they're so close and she's wonderful with them. Um, she grew her hair really, really, really long. And um, I thought, you know, she was just growing it long. Um, but I don't know how she must've spent a year growing it so long. And then she donated it 
to, and I can't think of the charity now. It's, um, but it's one that specifically makes wigs for. Is it the Locks of it's, Love one? No, it's demand. not that one. It's okay. it's like wigs for kids, or but it's specifically Aww. for children of cancer. And she, I mean, she grew Lovely. it so long, and she um, cut her hair, donated it to the charity, and um, she got like a certificate of appreciation and thank you and stuff, you know. And she did it. You can do it in honor of someone, and she did it in honor of me. And so I, they sent me to you know the certificate with my name and her name and. I just still think this was like two summers ago, I think. And it was just the sweetest thing. Um, and so, it's yeah, cool. even the kids, the kids have found ways to be supportive and loving. And yeah, I think a lot of times about how in here in our culture in the U.S., we we hide away the things that are hard. Right. It used to be that when people died that they're, you know, that happened in the home that happened with everybody being involved. Now, now we hide that away. We do it with birth too, right? Birth and um, breastfeeding and all of that. We, we hide these things away. Um, and so a couple of years into my diagnosis, I went on a little bit of a rampage to find all the people I could find who's had a parent that passed away from cancer. And my burning question for them was, what would you have wanted your mom, dad, uncle, grandfather, whatever, do differently, better, you know, what went well, what went bad. And um, no matter how old the people were that I talked to, no matter how long it had been since they had a parent or a loved one pass away from cancer, every single person used almost exactly the same language. They said, they hid things from me. And I knew stuff because I listened um, you know, you never know who's lurking behind the door when you're having a conversation with someone else or with a doctor or whatever. Every single one of them in, you know, various, their own words shared with me that they knew a whole lot more than they were told because they were listening. And because their families did not share things with them, they filled in the details with their active imaginations and so I've really tried to take that to heart because um, I, I'm not a quiet person. No one who knows me would think that I was a quiet person. I do a lot of advocacy. I'm, you know, talking to drug companies and my insurance company and, um, you know, helping other patients and all of that. So I'm talking about these things in our home. And so, of course, my kids here. And of course, they are then, you know, thinking about those things. And so... Um, we've found it really, really important to make sure that we're remembering to have those conversations with them and really explain because we know they have questions and we know they're listening uh, yeah. because they're all listening to all of the things. And of course, they repeat every bad word you say and forget all the things that you're saying over and over and over again, right? That this is just oh, a yes. personal <laughs> child experience. Um, but I wanted to shift into... I know for me, when I was initially diagnosed, I had to have titanium rods put in both femurs. And so I was not, I was not moving. Like they had me in a wheelchair. They had me on crutches. It, it was um, a, a significant kind of immediate loss of mobility. And, and you mentioned some of those things as well. And so how has, or how have you needed to make adjustments in your parenting to accommodate the fact that your body just behaves differently now? Yeah. Other, other than the sleeping on the bleaches, bleachers, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Quite literally. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I um it's it's definitely changed it a lot. I thought I was gonna be this really active mom. When my first baby was born, I had the jogging stroller and I was out jogging, and I don't even know who that is anymore. <laughs> I, I can't jog. Um you know, when I first became stage four, um, my kids were, yeah, about almost one and almost three. Um, and I could not pick up the baby. I couldn't even pick her up because I truly, I had lost between the, the cancer and the chemo, and but I lost so much weight and it triggered hyperthyroid. So I was having thyroid problems and just and couldn't pick up my own baby and it was devastating. I'm like, I'm a mom. This is, they need me. And, and it was, um, it's been difficult to, you know, yeah, to shift like, okay, well, how, how am I going to do this? Um, 
And, you know, quite honestly, I just, we've just, I've just invited them into bed with me most of the time. And um, they, I would say, you know, okay, pick out a book and I'll read it to you. And then they started just getting books and bringing them to me in bed because um, even if I wasn't asleep, I just had to lay down. I just had to rest. I had to get off my feet a lot. Um, or I, I was just in bed a lot. And they, and so they, they'll pick out books and they'll come to me and we'll read them. Um, and it's, you know, it's the modern age, so they don't always want to read books. So they'll, um, they will get, they'll ask to look up funny animals on Instagram, you know, and we'll be Googling like corgi butts or, um, you know, bumblebee, <laughs> bumblebees sleeping in flowers or like, we'll just look up, you know, silly animals and <laughs> We'll look up chonky puppies or just, <laughs> and, but we just lay there and they get in with me and we scroll and we look at funny stuff or we, um, they bring their video game, their switch and they get in bed with me and I watch them play video games. I don't love that. I'll be honest. I don't, you know, watch, yeah. but I do love it because they want to share it with me and they want to be with me and they want to involve me in what they're doing. And, um, I can't, I can't play video games. I suck at them, but I mean, I, you know, when there's been so many days, countless days, um, that I could just really did not have the energy to get out of bed or get out of my wheelchair or go outside. And, yeah. um, but I have, but I love that. I love when we look at animals together or read a book or just, you know, just do, um, those things. And, and then I, I really made a point to be like, I'm going to get out there and do stuff with them. So um, I remember uh, one time we took, uh, I went in my wheelchair to the llama farm because my, my one kid is obsessed with animals and there's this llama farm we, <laughs> we go to pretty often. It was a baby llama born, very exciting. Um, and it's not paved or anything. It's a farm, but it's all flat. And I said, oh, what the heck? let's yeah. do it you know awesome. yeah hold up the manual wheelchair in the trunk and the kids pushed me i pushed myself a little um but we did it we went to the farm and <laughs> um yeah, that's awesome carrie uh carrie uh, jolyn is commenting that uh, she started the same practice about five years ago and she and her 13 year old daughter still do that at night so that is that is a durable kind of of thing to do but it's so important what you're mentioning is that it's not about what you're doing. It's about connecting and about having that individual time with your kids, e even if you're not doing something active. I know I was super active with, and boys are, are a little different than girls just from the beginning. They tend to be a little more physical, that sort of thing. And so I, I was so rowdy. <laughs> <laughs> it happens with everybody. My, my kids were teaching the little girls to like j climb on things and jump off of things because that did not occur to um, these girls that are friends of mine had. So um, they've always been really, really active. And, um, you know, initially that was something that real that I bonded with them on was, you know, being active, that sort of thing. And my, my oldest, who was four when I was diagnosed, was always very concerned. It's like, mommy, when are they going to fix your run so you can run with me? When are they going to fix your run? Um, and that was something that was super important to him at the time. But now he's 10 and he doesn't worry about my run anymore because I couldn't keep up with him anyway. But um, just, just that understanding that, yes, it looks different. Parenting looks different, but still connecting with our kids, still having that quality one-on-one -on -one time, still having those things that you do, like watch funny videos. We watch a lot of cat videos around here. Um, and but but that is still parenting and that is still connecting with your kids and that is still creating those moments that will stick with them and and they will remember um so i wanted to shift a little bit and talk about legacy because as as much as we want to be in the moment as much as we want to have hope um as much as we are all hoping that mbc come become something that's chronic versus something that will end our lives Unfortunately, we know the reality um, that we're facing. And I will never agree with people who think cancer is a gift. Like that is a hill I will die on because I can't wrap my brain around that kind of thought process. However, I do think one of the silver linings 
certainly that I've experienced is that we're aware that something is serious and something could end our lives. And so that gives us the gift of time or the gift of knowledge so that we can do something. We can do some things um, in order to preserve our legacy. So um, what are some things that you've done, Carrie, with your girls or planning for them? Yeah, um, I have two things I definitely want to mention. Um, so if I get, if I forget, remind me, I had a second point. <laughs> but um, one thing is just um, buying our house. We bought our house, even though I was already diagnosed, I already was stage four. Um, and it's a 30 year mortgage. And it's like you said, really hard sometimes to think about the long term and the future. Um, but we um, I didn't, I grew up in apartments, uh, it was not safe. And, um, then we, um, my, you know, we never, we've never bought a house. And so it was the first house we bought, um, just a couple of years ago. Um, and that's just been so important, um, to have something for our girls and something to leave them and, um, just, just the shelter and everything. And, um, and they sometimes draw on the walls or do, you know, and I'm like, you know what? go for it. We own the place. Like <laughs> That's okay. Right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and then we'll clean it later and, you know, but hopefully they'll help. And, but just, um, just having something like that to, to give them, um, has meant a lot, especially like I said, with, you know, me not growing up in a house or, or having anything like that. Um, so that's, that's important. And we're trying to like take care of the house. And what's interesting also about this that I have to say is a definitely a big adjustment to my parenting um is that after buying the house my um co-parent my my children's father and i actually split up we had been together oh gosh i don't know if i think 15 16 years but um the cancer and a lot of things were very stressful and we just you know we ultimately um decided to divorce but we have kept and will, I'm sure for quite a while, we've kept living together because our lives are complicated. We need each other. Um, I quit working and I'm on disability, which has been so great for my health. I rest more and I can um, just take better care of myself and it's reduced my pain and my side effects and I'm home with my kids to homeschool them and and I have so much more time with them so I am thankful for that but I don't have a lot of income mm -hmm. and um and then uh my co-parent <laughs> my um he you know he he works and but he needs help with the kids and, um, and we, it would be very stressful for the kids going back and forth. And ultimately I don't want to drop them off at their dads. I, I want to say good night to them. I want to, you know, be there every morning when they wake up. And so their dad and I, um, we've been, we've been divorced for almost four years. We've, wow. <laughs> we three and a half. Um, and we, um, still live together and we plan to continue doing that. And, um, it was difficult in the beginning. I bet. Yeah. But, um, but really I'm glad that my kids have both of their parents there every day. And, um, you know, we like to say that our, our marriage did end, but we're, we're still a family, you know, we're committed to our family. We take family vacations together and we just, you know, yeah. we, yeah. um, so that's been, Big adjustment. Didn't see that one coming, <laughs> but ultimately I, I am really grateful for it. And it's kind of forced my ex-husband and I to um, just communicate better and just um, both just focused on our self-care and the kids and then yeah, our, our relationship improved. So that's, that's been, beautiful. it's been, like I said, um, I just feel like, you know, cancer changes everything, everything about There's your life. There's a legacy yeah. for your kids that they can see that you guys made the best decision for each of you as individuals and didn't try to stick it out just because. I was list I was listening to NPR the other day and there's some new literature coming out about this concept of nesting. 
um, which is when there are parents who are divorcing to maintain the family residence, maintain the children living there, and then the parents come and go. Maybe they get an apartment that then they go back and forth with. And there are some studies, there are some literature that makes it seem like that might actually be better um, for kids than shuttling back and forth to, to different households. So kudos to the two of you for putting your children and your family first um, before your your individual needs. But you mentioned that there were two things. So what was the other thing? Thank you. Thank you. I, I have the ADHD myself. Oh my and sometimes I'm like, oh, what's, what were we talking about? Plus that end chemo brain, it gets really bad. Compounded. <laughs> Compounded. Yep, absolutely. Um, but yes, I, I definitely had another great um, thing I wanted to share because I have recently started working with a death doula. Mm -hmm. So which um, like a birth doula, but a death doula that um, helps you do, um, you know, end of life review, um, death plans, um, not only for what you would want in your final weeks, days, hours, mm -hmm. um, but afterwards, you know, what do you want done? And it's so thorough and detailed and, um, I could do that on my own. I could, but for me, it's been really helpful having this death doula that is pushing me along, no pressure, but checking in and kind, you know, because I, I want to do it. And I, of course, met with NBC. We we're just, you know, forced to confront these things and forced to think about end of life and our children without us and all of these things we don't want to think about. Um, but so even though I wanted to make my will and my death plans and things, I was still putting it off, putting it off. Um, so this I death doula, many of us do. <laughs> right? the death doula has been great. Um, and we, we meet or sometimes it's on zoom and there's, you know, specific questions. There was like meditations we did. There was some writing prompts. Um, and then this whole really detailed, you know, plan. Um, but it's been great to think about what I want to leave to my daughters, very, you know, very specifically what I want to happen to, I plan to be buried as a tree. Very nice. Very mm -hmm. California. <laughs> I am, you know, yes, I'm a California girl. I, <laughs> I can't deny it. Um, but yeah, I want to be buried as a tree. Um, they're on our property and so I'll just always be there and they can, you know, come, That's um, come be there with me and, um, but yeah, um, and then the, the, the death doula is also a um, ghost writer. So helping me write a book to really leave behind, you know, just my advice, my um, stories I want to share, memories, whatever, you know, just all kinds of things that, yeah, that I want uh, them, not just my daughters, especially my daughters, really all my loved ones. But um, yeah. I think we're writing it um, like to my daughters in the future. Mm -hmm. That's that's beautiful. And such great foreshadowing because in two weeks at our next uh, webinar, we will be having a death doula come talk about the value of having someone like that come alongside, right? That the whole doula idea is somebody that's coming alongside as a helper as you go through a transition like becoming a mom or um, transitioning otherwise. So stay tuned for that because that is going to be a really, really cool conversation. I think she's just a really um, amazing person. Um, but I love this whole idea of um, being very intentional, right, about what we're leaving behind for our kids. And I, I will share with you a friend of mine, um, this really impacted me. So she unexpectedly lost her husband to brain cancer. And this was many years ago. And they had no videos or auditory, any tapes of his voice, except for their answering machine cassette tape, right? This is a little while ago, um, that little answering machine cassette tape that had his voice on it. And she said they they wore out that cassette tape by listening, just wanting to hear his voice, she and her, and her children. And so I have found it really important to think about all the different um, ways people can take, um, rem remember somebody, right? So certainly writing is um, one way. Um, another way is to preserve our, our literal voices, right? 
Um, another way is to preserve our, our images or to have a, a record of us being with our children. And so a couple of things that I've done um, every year, I have my husband give me a professional photo shoot for Mother's Day. I don't want all the tchotchkes or all the other little things because that doesn't mean as much anymore. But but having a professional photographer come in and document me being with my kids every year for Mother's Day has become a tradition that um, I kind of wish I had thought about that before. Because, of course, who's taking the pictures? The mom is usually taking the pictures, right? And um, legitimately, if I am caught in a picture that someone else is taking, I'm always making a weird face or my mouth is open or, or something like that. So being very intentional about having those professional photo shoots has been something that's been really significant for us. Um, I also worked with an organization called Through My Eyes, T-H-R-U, My Eyes. They're out of New York. And um, so they had a licensed mental health counselor, or it might have been a psychologist, some mental health person, um, interviewed me on camera um, and really delved into, you know, what are the things for my childhood that were very impactful and those other things, um, things that quite frankly, you might forget to say, right? Unless somebody was was asking those questions. Um, another great uh, resource is something called StoryWorth. And, um, and you can gift this to somebody. It's about $50. And for a year, they get an email with a question once a week, or you can have it be more frequent. And they respond. They can respond to the email. They can provide pictures, et cetera. And at the end of the year, you get a bound book with all of those questions, all of those answers, all of those pictures. So again, something that that is um, a keepsake. Um, Another thing that I've done is I came up with a list and solicited a lot of input on what are those important milestones or those important days when you want to talk to your mom. So things like you break up with somebody for the first time, you fail your first test, you graduate from college, you get married, you, um, you know, meet somebody, the love of your life for the first time. And so I've assembled cards for each of those important moments um, or just, you know, they had a bad day um, so that they would have a card from me with, with information or, you know, some saying something. So, you know, things that will be something that will be a resource for them for them later on um, in life. Uh, for those of us who have a genetic predisposition for cancer, um, one thing that has been, I think, a little difficult for me to wrap my head around is that it's not ethical to uh, test children for um, diseases that would only affect them as an adult. Like they have, you have to wait until they're 18 and they can make that decision. But the way that things are with MBC, the likelihood of me being here to help them walk through a genetic predisposition for cancer, which they may receive from me because I have one, um, you know, that has been something that I've struggled with. And so I've, you know, written letters and and things like that. And, you know, certainly my husband knows how important I think it is for them to know if they carry the same genetic predisposition that I do. So just a, a few examples of the things that that we've done. And I am sure that um, all of you have so many more ideas. And so I would invite each of you to, um, to send us, you can uh, send an email to laura at survivingbreastcancer.org. You can send an email to me, abigail at survivingbreastcancer.org and share with us, what are you doing to maintain the, your legacy for your children? What are the things that you think are um, really important to pass on to, to your children? It certainly could be money. It could be property. It could be jewelry. It could be anything. But but what are those things? And I, I would love us to be able to have some ideas um, on the blog for that. Um, so we talked about the death doula coming in two weeks. I also wanted to talk about um, and let you all know that on November 8th, um, we will be welcoming um, a representative from Bright Spot Network. Um, and that was actually one of the things that Carrie shared with us that she wanted to share with all of you. But Bright Spot is an amazing organization that focuses on supporting children when they have a parent with cancer. Um, they have lots of, of resources and Carissa is going to be coming to talk about that. Um, we'll have a representative from Living Beyond Breast Cancer uh, to talk about their Reading for Reassurance program. Bright Spot has a very similar 
um, thing where you tell them the age of your child and they send you books that you can read with your children. And it's just a great starting place, right? Just like the Barbie, um, just, you know, something else that's not you saying something, but something that helps your children have that conversation. Um, and we'll also be welcoming on November 8th an author who is about to publish a book on talking with children about metastatic breast cancer. Um, so as if you're listening and you're a parent, you probably are aware that, yes, there are a few books, but there are not enough. And they don't have enough information about those of us who are going to be in treatment forever, right? Most of the books that are written are about, you know, it's this specific period in time and it's done and then mommy is okay. But for those of us who are in treatment forever, it's a little bit of a different conversation. So Sarah Olschler is going to be joining us. We'll probably be raffling off one of her books, which I'm super excited about. Um, so please feel free to, to join us for, for that conversation. But we want to leave you with these resources and we want to talk with all of you about these things that, that we've discovered so that you have a place to go, so that you have a place to um, uh, you know, ask questions, get support. Um, most therapists, um, especially when you have young kids, you know, therapy is not really something, talk therapy, right? Doesn't really work for kids, especially if they're not verbal or if they're very young. And so, um, you know, that is another resource though, is obtaining a licensed professional to help your child process all of these things and have a safe space to process that. You know, a lot of times there are resources through guidance counselors at schools and, and things like that that can be that can be helpful as well. So just wanting to leave some pe everyone with some practical things. I hope you've learned a little bit today. And Carrie, thank you so much for being so transparent and sharing about your experience with, with your girls and, and with NBC. Um, it's just been a, a lovely conversation. Uh, I see Laura has joined us. Thank you for moderating the comments, Laura. <laughs> but love tonight's dialogue. Um, thank you both Abigail and Carrie for sharing your personal experiences and so many good takeaways, just what I was seeing in the chat as well. I wanted to share with everyone, as you were mentioning, Abigail, um, where people can go and get resources. Mm -hmm. We talk a lot about so many things. We are trying to create almost this one-stop shop um, at survivingbreastcancer.org. So if you go to survivingbreastcancer.org forward slash living with metastatic breast cancer, Yes, it's spelling out because, you know, that's how SEO works these days. Um, but that's where you can go. You can find future events that we're hosting, our webinar series. We've started to upload different files. So after all of these uh, great ideas that come together, we'll put together a worksheet. So it'll be there for resources that you can download. And so, again, just really, we, we are here to provide our experiences and, you know, pass it forward. So thank you both for being such great supporters of our work and sharing your story and <clears throat> navigating it all. So thank you. Thank you and for having wanted, me. Yes, thank you for being here, Carrie. Just wanted to shout out too, during the month of October, Breast Cancer Awareness Month, um, SPC does a wonderful job of highlighting those of us who are living with metastatic breast cancer. And so if you want to share your story, um, please feel free to send that over to, to Laura. Um, again, Laura at survivingbreastcancer.org. Um, there's a blog. She's got a weekly newsletter. There's all kinds of ways for you to communicate those things that are important to you. And again, just wanted to point out, if you've got resources that you've used as parenting um, while you're parenting with MBC, if you've got um, suggestions in terms of organizations, um, at SBC, we partner with people who are doing an amazing job in their niche, in their lane, and we'd love to highlight and share other organizations that are doing an amazing job. So please feel free to send those. Really, 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 I mean it. Please feel free to share yeah, those things. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I really do. So we're doing this um, twice a month now um, on a Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern. And so um, I'm super excited about the lineup for the rest of September, for October, November. And so I hope you'll join us for another one of these discussions and um, anybody's suggestions in terms of who we might bring on to have a discussion with or who you think would be great to provide um, resources or information. We are always eager and open to highlighting the le legitimate, what is it like to live? with 
a terminal diagnosis that is hanging over your head? What is it like to be a person and have to carry that and have to interact with the world and kids and spouses and family members and friends and random strangers and all of that? So um, if you have those ideas, we are our ears are open and we would love to hear from you. And with that, I think we will end. Yes, 